instruction and encouragement. In Jesus' name we pray. Church said amen. I'm going to take you to Daniel chapter 4. You may be seated, verse 4. Daniel chapter 4, verse 4. This is interesting. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, uh, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house. Flourishing in my palace. Do you find that just kind of intriguing? That phrase, I was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. I got a phone call. I'm using the story by permission. I'll be a bit guarded. It was a strange call. It wasn't, it was in the night, but not, it was around midnight. Not too long ago. It, it was the inspiration for my thought today to speak to you about uh, because the, the person that I was talking to did not say it exactly this way it was later after the phone call that I just casually opened my Bible and you know how your eyes will kind of scan down through the page and I saw this description by King Nebuchadnezzar as he was trying to get uh, an audience with Daniel so that Daniel could help him to figure out what was going on inside his life, inside his heart, inside his mind. You see, the king had had this, this was not a godly man, it was not a, it was not, Someone who believed in Daniel's God. He had other gods. In fact, the king had chosen another name for Daniel. And he said, Daniel, I'm going to call you after the name that would have been given to you by my God. So he was not a friend of, of Jehovah. These two men were on two different pages. They were confronting two different kinds of destinies. Destiny, that's an interesting word, isn't it? Destiny. But the king is troubled by something that had been given to him. A dream, a word. And he called all the soothsayers in and all the people that he thought had any kind of uh, psychic powers or whatever. And he set them all down and he challenged them to reveal to him what it was. And he had heard that there was this man, this Hebrew, this Israelite, that had the gift or at least some kind of power, some kind of anointing, some something that made it possible for him to, to know and to interpret things and to, and to bring things into focus. He had heard about some of his prophecies that Daniel had given while being held in prison. And so he called him forth and said, I've talked to all the witches and the soothsayers, and, but there's something, something, something that's so deep inside of me and I can't seem to find anybody that can really explain to me what it is I saw and what it is 
I felt in that dream. And Daniel, of course, did give him the interpretation. He said, first of all, just so to ease your mind, it was kind of an interesting thing. What Nebuchadnezzar had felt was not really about him, but it was about the enemies that were going to come against him. It was about the cultural structure that was going to uh, bring chaos into the situation. In fact, if you looked at this carefully, you could see that some of the elements that we're facing now as Americans and as churches, like churches like our church, apostolic churches, Calvary Tabernacle, your family, my family, that's affecting pulpits, that's affecting organizations. There's some kinds of elements, things that's working in the world today that is really forcing us to adjust the way we think and maybe even to reevaluate what we truly believe. These are serious times. I think you all would agree. So Daniel is called in and he's working with this thing. But he, he is uh, given this little explanation by the king. He said, this is an interesting thing you see, Daniel, because I really wasn't looking for this. In fact, I was at my own house and I was flourishing. I was just kicking back in my house. Is that what it says? But a word came to me, something came to me, a troubling dream awakened my consciousness. And this thing is so strong and so powerful that I can't get away from it. And such was the phone call. The phone call that drove me to this verse of scripture accidentally, because after the phone call, then I was just flipping through the Bible, as I said, and there it was. And I thought, well, now that is a beautiful and even poetic explanation of what had just been explained to me by a person that had called me to talk and counsel. Not a member of this church. So not anybody you would know, actually. Because that's kind of what he said. I was just in my house. I was just living my life. I was just going about my business. And it was like this brother Mooney it was like something it was like something that you said how long I don't know 35 maybe 40 years ago I have no memory uh, no memory of it at all he said it was like just something you said while you were preaching and I I was listening to you at a certain place in a certain camp meeting or some place And he said, I wrote it down. But I didn't just write it down on paper. I did that, but something else. It was like in me. I never got away from it. It lived in me. I would forget it for times, but it kept coming back. Now, this had nothing to do with prophecy or some kind of, you know, spooky stuff or anything. It It was just something that... That, that he had caught, as it were. You know, the word is caught at times, and it just impacts you, and it alters you, and changes you. So here was this word that it could have been from any preacher. This has nothing to do with me. He just was trying to say that all these years, these decades of time, and you were just a young preacher, and you were preaching, and yet this thing that you said got inside of me. This is exactly what is happening here in the Bible. This thing is so troubling. I was just living my life. I was in my own house and there I was. And the dream made me afraid. Go back to my original verse if you would please. I saw the dream and there it was in my house and I was flourishing in my palace. But whatever it was that had come to this Leader, this as we might say, secular leader, a leader, this person who was not connected with Jehovah God. But something did touch him. Did, could you see it here? It was troubling. And my friend, after decades, could say, I never quite got away from it. Now, here's the fact that that is not an unusual thing. I've had that happen to me hundreds of times. Where people would say, you know, I went to church and it seemed like God spoke to me and I never could quite ever get free from that. Do you realize right now while we're having church in this place, there are multiplied millions of people who have been given a word from the Lord. 
I promise you in this city, there are people who did not come to church today, but there's something alive inside of them, the word of God. There is this urging, there is this moving, there is this, there is this touch that somewhere, at some place, it could have been in a, snore, a storefront, it might have been at a camp meeting, it might have just been in a Sunday school class where a, a teacher was just talking to a child and suddenly, suddenly the word of God breaks through, breaks into the consciousness, breaks into the spirit, breaks into the heart, breaks into the passions of a child or maybe a teenager and that thing is so alive, that word is so real that it shakes you and makes you realize that even in your house and even in your palace, you are not completely protected from the word of God. When God gets ready to speak, he can speak. And I'm here to tell you, if God has ever spoken to you, you can never, ever escape it. Those of you that have felt conviction, I went to a meeting one night. My heart wasn't right, but something got a hold of me. I wish I could just get a little help now. And it doesn't matter where you go after God touches you and places that word upon you. Call it a word of prophecy if you want to. Call it a word of destiny. It is destiny, really. And there's not just a few. There are millions, multiplied millions of people. And here we are in a strange time, a strange moment, a crucial moment in history. Here we all are. But every one of us in this place are not just here because we philosophically tried to embrace the idea or the greatness or the inspiration that we could say would come from Christ. Oh, we're so impressed with his sacrifices and no 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 the, what i'm talking about is something beyond how you've emotionally or how you've intellectually worked out the calling of god in your life you know so many people play around with the calling of god but it's more than just something philosophical it's something more than just in your uh in your uh say in your vocabulary your kind of uh your spiritual people have spiritual cap vocabularies, but this is something else. This is like something that God set on fire inside of you. And my friend said, I just can't get away from it. It's always been there. It's a living thing. It's like a, it's like a hammer that goes off inside my head. I don't know how God works all the time, but I do know that it is possible for God to place his anointing and his touch in your life, and usually it's some kind of word. I know that there are people in this place right now that have callings and have a touch of God. You felt something, something moved you, and it wasn't just your loyalty to the pastor. It wasn't just your loyalty to the church. It was the touch of God and the word of God that penetrated into your consciousness, penetrated into your soul, penetrated into your thoughts and you can not only up to this point you can say I can't get away from it but let me tell you something else you are never going to get away from it this thing lives in him we live and move and have our being and here we are in this interesting time when so much is being thrown at us So much is being given to us and we got all kinds of dialogue and debates and political agendas and pronouncements and announcements and and all kinds of denunciating things and false news. Isn't this interesting about the false news? People using their journalistic skills to invent stories so that they can try to control your mind, make you think a certain way, make you reach a certain kind of political uh, conclusion or some kind of thought, some kind of feeling about people. These, these people that are doing this fake news are completely blinded by their own arrogance and haughtiness. That they really believe that they can manipulate people and to some degree I suppose that's true. And we live in a time when people would like to just drag you into their clubs drag you into their meetings, drag you into their philosophies, drag you into their false religions, drag you into their political positions, false news. But there also is real news, ladies and gentlemen. There's a real life. Can I get a witness? 
I don't know much about destiny. I, I played around with that word through the years, destiny.